I think you can see how concepts that are launched at one point in the text then actually become the, the simple basis for an advance of an argument at a later point in the text. Now, if you remember, Marx starts off with the theory of the commodity, and so the first question is what fixes the value, or how does he define the value of the commodity? So, how did he define it? What's the value of the commodity? Socially necessary labour time, okay? So the value is socially necessary labour time. Now if you go back to the passages where he talked about socially necessary labour time, you'll find it's immediately followed, and this is back on page 130, 131, it's immediately followed by a discussion of the impact of changing productivity upon the value of commodities. So, the question is, what does rising productivity do to the value of commodities? Lowers them, so the, it lowers the unit value of commodities. We then combine that with a discussion of the value of labour power. What was it fixed the value of labour power? Can it be a bit more elaborate? It's not just simply the time necessary to reproduce. It's the, it's, it's the value of the means of subsistence needed to reproduce the labourer at a given standard of living. So it's the value of that bundle of commodities that the labourer needs to survive. Now when he was discussing this, he pointed out that that value varies a great deal, according to conditions of class struggle, the degree of civilization in a country, uh, so the bundle of commodities was not constant across space and time, but then he said, but at a given, in a given society at a given time, we know what that bundle is, and so therefore we have a datum which we can establish, which is the value of labour power. But then what he does is to go one step further and say this, that we're not simply dealing with this historical and moral element. So you go to page 276. And then you'll find a little short paragraph down there where he, he gives a definition which we're giving. The value of labour power can be resolved into the value of a definite quantity of the means of subsistence. It therefore varies with the value of the means of subsistence, i.e. with the quantity of labour time required to produce them. So what happens to the value of this bundle of commodities when there's rising productivity? Falls. Therefore, the value of labour power declines. 
not in terms of physical, of what people are physically receiving. You still get the same bundle of commodities, right? But they just cost you much less. The value has gone down. Now, that happens as a connection between these two, but there's a funny thing about this connection. Does any increase in productivity do this? Just, just, just in what we would call, this only operates with respect to what we would call wage goods, i.e., those which enter into this bundle of commodities. So an increase in productivity in making mink coats for the bourgeoisie doesn't do it. The increase in productivity which makes a Lexus cheaper doesn't do it. So any but anything that goes into this bundle of commodities, which is affected by this, generates, therefore, a lower value of labour power. Now how does Marx define the rate of exploitation? What is the rate of exploitation? Okay. Simply put, S over V. What happens to S over V as V goes down? The rate of exploitation increases. Now, well, of course, what he does in this section is to start out by saying, well, imagine that the working day is fixed, and you can't change the length of the working day anymore. And remember, the previous chapter ro ro sort of took up the question of limits. What are the limits on the mass of the surplus value which the capitalist can gain? And those limits are fixed by two things, the rate of surplus value <coughs> and by the number of labourers you employ. So if the number of labourers you employ is fixed, and the length of the working day is fixed, then the only way you can hope to increase the rate of exploitation and the rate of surplus value is by decreasing the amount you spend on V. Now again, he starts off this se section by saying, well, we know that capitalists are very anxious to reduce wages as much as they can. We just heard, right? But I'm not going to consider that case. So, he sets up an argument which is again based on the propositions of political economy about a perfectly functioning world. So he says on 431, yeah, I know that capitalists will try to reduce wages below value. So he says, but the surplus labour would in this case be prolonged only by transgressing the normal limits. Its domain would be extended only by usurpation of part of the domain of necessary labour time. Despite the important part which this method plays in practice, we are excluded. From considering it here by our assumption that all commodities, including labour power, are bought and sold at their full value. Now this again is another instance, and we've come across them many times in Capital, and we're going to come across them again, where Marx, in order to make his argument, stays within the assumptions of a perfectly functioning political economic system as depicted by the political economists of the 18th and early 19th centuries. <coughs> 
And as we've already discussed, the reason he does that is he wants to say, even if their system worked, according to their utopian plans, we would get a very different result than that which Adam Smith predicted. So he's being very rigorous about staying within these assumptions. But he's saying, look, we can get this effect of an increased rate of exploitation simply by combining the argument about the value of the commodity with the argument about the value of labour power. Now this immediately raises some very interesting questions, which Marx does not at this point immediately take up. For example, let's suppose there is a dramatic increase in productivity, and wage goods come way, way, way down in value. What would happen if you gave a bit of that saving to the working class? You could actually increase the rate of exploitation while increasing the physical living standard of the workers. Now this is a very, very important element in the argument, because one of the things that people will always say to you is, Marx is always talking about an increasing rate of exploitation, but my God, look how well off the working class are now in terms of the products they've got as opposed to what they had 150 years ago. So his thesis about an increasing rate of exploitation is obvious nonsense. Well, the answer to that is, it's not obvious nonsense at all. It's perfectly feasible within a capitalist system that increasing productivity produces such an increase in the quantities of, of commodities which are available that a certain segment has to go to the working class, otherwise you wouldn't have a market. And that segment that does go to the working class is, of course, one of the great ways in which you can pull the working class into support for capitalism by saying, look, you're getting better off all of the time. You have more goods now than you had 30, 40 years ago. Now whether that sharing of the gains of, co of, of productivity actually occurs depends on well, class struggle, of course, like the length of the working day. Marx does not actually introduce that here, but elsewhere in Capital and elsewhere in his writings he does, in fact, entertain this possibility. But historically I think there's a very interesting thing we have to look at. If you look at the history of American labour, up until around 1970, American labour always benefited by an increase in its living standards as it shared somewhat in rising productivity. And in fact, a typical trade union bargaining thing in the 1960s was precisely to say to the unions, you agree to these means by which we will increase productivity, and we'll agree to give you more money so that you get more in the marketplace. So it's a kind of productivity sharing agreement. Since the 1970s, all of the data in this country show, not necessarily globally, but in this country show, that the working class has not benefited from gains in productivity hardly at all. In other words, real wages have remained pretty stagnant for the last 20-30 years, a little bit increased in the 1990s, but been pretty much stagnant, which means that the working class has not shared in the benefits that come 
from rising productivity. So guess who's taking it all? Well, you know, hedge fund folk and all the rest of it. So we get an incredible increase in inequality over the last thirty years, which is partly an indicator of the fact that working class in this country has not benefited from this at all. Again, that has a lot to do with the state of class struggle, how class struggle is being set up and all the rest of it. Marx does not deal with that in this chapter. But it is implicit in the analysis, and I think it's very important at, at this point in the argument to insert it as part and parcel of what is possible here. So the proposition would simply be this, that it is entirely feasible for there to be an increase in the physical living standards of the working class, at the same time as there is an increase in the rate of exploitation. So bear that proposition in mind. Secondly, there's another issue which he does raise in this chapter, but which I want to suggest might have a slightly different answer. What happens when somebody increases productivity? An individual capitalist increases the productivity in shoe production and the value of shoes goes down and this is what workers need. See what happens. An individual capitalist does something which is of benefit to the whole working class, to the whole capitalist class, sorry. It's of benefit to everybody in the capitalist class. Because the value of labour power goes down because shoes are cheaper, all capitalists can pay less value. So he raises the question, why would an individual capitalist do something which is for the benefit of the whole capitalist working class? I mean, maybe they're endowed with incredible class consciousness <laughs> when they do this. But at some point they're likely to get really teed off, in the sense that they'll say, well look, I'm putting all this in effort into innovating and raising productivity, everybody's benefiting, you're all sitting around doing nothing, you're playing what's called the free rider game. You're, you're all, all the rest of you, you're doing nothing. I mean, even you people making mink coats are benefiting from this. So why would I as an individual capitalist do that? What is the incentive for me? Well, yes, I can pay my labourer just a little bit less, because shoes are a bit cheaper, but it's, it's a very small amount of gain I get for a large amount of effort. So Marx is going to talk about how it is that individual capitalists are persuaded to do this. And his answer is going to be based on something again that we have come up against before, which is the idea of the coercive laws of competition. Now Marx is very restrained about how to look on competition throughout capital. In part, I think, because he wants to view it a bit like demand and supply, as something that equilibriates the system, rather than being fundamental to the character of the system. So what he does is, is to sort of then immediately introduce the idea. We have to look, he says, at the rules of competition. So on 4.33 he says, It is not our intention here to consider the way in which the immanent laws of capitalist production manifest themselves in the external movement of the individual capitals, assert themselves as the coercive laws of competition, and therefore enter into the consciousness 
of the individual capitalist as the motives which drive him forward. This much is clear, a scientific analysis of competition is possible only if we can grasp the inner nature of capital. That is, you've got to understand what it is that competition is, is, is going to do. And if you can't understand what competition is going to do, you can't understand what, why a capitalist society tolerates or likes competition. And as he says, this scientific analysis is possible only if we can grasp the inner nature of capital, just as the apparent motions of the heavenly bodies are intelligible only to someone who is acquainted with their real motions, which are not perceptible to the senses. Again, there's a notion here which comes back a little bit close to fetishism, right? That there's a disguise. That if we just look at competition in itself, we're going to miss the point. It's disguising something else. What is it disguising? What is disguising, he points out on 434-435, is this. That socially necessary labour time is a social average. So the value of commodities is a social average. And at any one particular moment, some capitalists will be working above that average, and some will be working below that average. Those who are working below that average will, get, will be selling at the average, but producing at below average. Therefore, they'll be getting a little bit more surplus value. Those selling above will be getting less surplus value than the social average. So there's a distinction between those who are Everybody's selling at the social average, but those who are producing above the social average and those who are producing below the social average. And if you go back to those passages about socially necessary labour time and productivity, Marx introduces the question, what happens when you get handloom weavers against powerloom weavers? the productivity of the power loom weavers is immensely greater. So what happens to value? Well, value starts to come, come down. And eventually, of course, the hand loom weavers are going to be driven out of business, because they can't compete anymore. But notice what happens in the midst of this process. Let's suppose the social average, we do it in a graph kind of form, at any one particular moment, the social average is that. Ten units to produce a widget or whatever. Let's suppose I come up with a superior way of making widgets. Then I'm still going to sell at this average, but I'm going to produce at this one here. So what I get is an extra piece of surplus value. But then what happens? At some point, maybe I start to produce a lot more widgets because I've got so productive. So I will start to try to outcompete everybody else and extend my market by bringing the value down. This is the original time to time two. In which case, I'm still getting extra but I'm now out-competing everybody else, so anybody else who's producing much above that is beginning to get into competitive trouble. What do you do if you're in competitive trouble? You say, what on earth is my competitor doing that allows my competitor to go into the market and produce so cheaply? Oh, they've got a new machine. Okay, I can get a new machine. So what my competitor does is then say, ah, I'm going to follow you in your technological innovation. I'm going to come down to here. And pretty soon, everybody is down to here, the value is here, and my surplus value has disappeared, my extra surplus value has disappeared. So what Marx says about this is that there is a form of surplus value, driven in this way by the coercive laws of competition, 
which is ephemeral. It only lasts as long as I am ahead of the pack in terms of my production technique, my organizational technique, but it will disappear as soon as everybody catches up with me. And this is what individual capitalists are after when they innovate. They're not after this form of sur surplus value at all. They would have the surplus rider problem, they would probably stop it. But they are after this, because as an individual capitalist, I can get this ephemeral kind of surplus value just for a while by having a superior technology. But notice something immediately. I then think to myself, well, there's something about that superior technology that was extremely advantageous to me, so I'm going to find another superior technology. And pretty soon my competitors almost will get up to the idea and say, superior technology seems a pretty good idea. So I'm going to get superior technologies. So what the coercive laws of competition tend to do is to generate leapfrogging innovations in which there is a competitive fight to try to get the most superior technology in that search for this ephemeral form of surplus value, which gives me windfall profits, if you want to call it that, ephemeral excess surplus value just for that period of time. So here's a very happy coincidence. The individual motivation of the capitalist driven by the coercive laws of competition, produce this effect, i.e. the reduction in the value of labour power. Now it's interesting here that what Marx is doing is taking individual behaviour and setting it alongside class perspective. And this is also very important that capitalists rarely act individually in a class interest. But what drives them individually is to do something which is in the class interest. Which is why he wants you to understand that the reason that capitalists keep on yakking on about competition, and everybody goes on and on and on about the importance of com competition and being competitive and so on, etc., 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 is because it produces this kind of result. This happy coincidence between what's happening to the individual ca capitalist and what's happening to the class interest is really very strongly presented here. This also produces something else. I suggested that capitalists driven by the coercive laws of competition are going to be pushed towards innovation. Now, there's an interesting thing. In a lot of studies you will find innovation treated as something which is outside of, it's external to dynamics. It's an exogenous variable, it's outside of, it just happens, you know. Edison had an idea or somebody else had an idea or, you know, it just happened. But what Marx is, is doing here is actually internalizing it within the logic of capital itself. That is, when you see what he's doing here, you immediately would understand that there's no way in which a capitalist society cannot be technologically dynamic. It has to be. And of course, historically, many people now would look at other modes of production, 
and say, well, you know, the problem was they weren't technologically dynamic. One of the criticisms of uh, the ex-Soviet Union was they weren't technologically dynamic. They didn't come up with you know new brands of toothpaste at you know two a month or something like that. They didn't do those kinds of things. Actually, they were technologically dynamic in certain areas, laser technologies and all those kinds of things, but they were not technologically dynamic in the way that capitalism is. But what comes out of this is that technological dynamism is both inevitable and a good thing. If somebody came from outer space and put a moratorium upon technological change under capitalism, then the whole system would collapse. So what Marx is kind of saying is there's an internal necess necessity. That's what the value theory goes back to about the socially necessary. What is socially necessary for capitalism to survive? Technological dynamism. Along, of course, with growth. Capitalism either grows or dies. It's technologically dynamic or it dies. What Marx is doing here is, is, is explaining to us why and how that internalization of technological dynamism becomes so important. So you don't go back to the great inventors and all that kind of stuff and explain technological dynamism simply by talking about the great inventors. You explain it by a system that begins to sort of particularly kick in towards the end of the 18th century, in which this internalization of technological dynamism really pick, takes off. And that is, if you like, a central aspect of a capitalist mode of production. <clears throat> but then this leads to one other question. Is there any way in which capitalists could realize this increased exploitation through collective action? Marx here does not raise that possibility. But actually that possibility was raised in the chapter on the working day. Can you remember what it was? What was it that the industrial interest wanted? No. No. What they, what they wanted was cheap what? Cheap bread. They wanted the Corn Laws repealed. They wanted cheap imports of wheat so they could have cheap bread, so they could lower wages, so that they could be more competitive on the global economy. That's what the Manchester School of Economics was about. That's what Cobden and Bright and the, the anti-corn law agitation was about. It was cheap bread. So actually there is a way in which a capitalist class interest can be expressed in tariff policy. Where do you think most of the gains in physical living standards, insofar as they're there at all, over the last twenty or thirty years has come from? Where does it come from? Cheap Chinese imports. Walmart. And you fool around with the Walmart economy and you fool around with ch cheap Chinese imports and see what it does to the physical standard of living of the working class. In other words, tariff policy becomes very, very much mixed up. And part of what you're seeing right now is a kind of crazy business, the AFL-CIO saying we've got to stop the export of jobs to China because that means loss of jobs here. <laughs>
but in so doing, of course, they're likely to undermine the standard of living of working class. And actually it turns out that most of the job losses in this country are not due to outsourcing. What are they due to? Technological change. About sixty percent of the job reduction amongst the working class in this country over the last thirty years has been due to technological change. When I arrived in Baltimore there were something like twenty-seven thousand people employed in Bethlehem Steel. By the time you get to 1990 there are about five thousand people employed in Bethlehem Steel producing the same amount of steel. And eventually, of course, it all disappears, gone to China and Korea and Japan and all the rest of it. But the point, the, the point here is that you can see immediately what the collective interest might be over things like free trade, tariff policy, and all the rest of it, and why it actually makes it rather complicated for a working class movement to argue for protectionism and at the same time kind of want to have cheap goods to support its standards of living. So in other words, you have to mix up this external kind of dynamic. <coughs> there are other, other places where this collective interest comes out. <coughs> Consider the tax system. What is exempt from sales tax in New York State? Hmm? Food. Food. Yeah. This is a pretty good example, right? What about agricultural subsidies which give you cheap agricultural, cheap milk, cheap agricultural produ products? Europe has maintained a lot of its standard of living through agricultural subsidies. So there's a whole kind of arena here of class politics around what is, the, what is going to be the value of this bundle of commodities which you enter into. So if you, if you suddenly taxed all the food uh, at the same rate as you're taxing everything else, and that would raise, I mean, and the, wage, the wage demands would go skyrocketing up, right, immediately. So, again, there are, it turns out, collective ways. And some of them his have historically been very, very interesting. For example, the industrial interest has, on occasion, supported subsidized housing for the workers, rent control. And in fact, in some countries, in, for instance, in France in the 1920s, the industrial interest was fiercely behind rent control. And subsidized housing has played, played a very important role in keeping a country competitive in terms of the wages it had to pay. One of the long-term effects of Margaret Thatcher privatizing all of the social housing in Britain was to raise the cost of housing to the point where Britain became non-competitive in many areas of industrial activity. So kind of basically it's car industry, the, the British car industry sort of disappeared and all kinds of things like that. So politics gets played around what is it that is fixing the value of this bundle of commodities. So Marx does a great job in this chapter of talking about the way in which this individual incentive has this effect, but he does not take up what is the other part of the story, which is the collective way in which capitalist class interests and working class interests and the interests of those classes who have no immediate uh, stake in the issue get involved in a kind of struggle over tariff policy, taxation policy, subsidies policy to agriculture and to, to and all kinds of arguments of, of, of that sort. So the class character of that starts to become significant. And as I say, I think it's a pity that Marx didn't mention this here, and actually doesn't take it up uh, elsewhere, to, to, to my knowledge. <coughs>
So this is, if you like, the theory of relative surplus value. It's a very simple formulation, as I've suggested, but it's one you have to really think about and, and get straight by going back over these propositions. Going back over, for example, what is it that fixes the value of labour power? And then asking the question, what is it that fixes the value of that bundle of commodities? So you've got to get those connections straight. Because for some reason or other, people often seem to have difficulty in seeing the difference between this social class form that I'm talking about and the individual form, and what the relationship is between the two. But I think you can see it immediately when you say, rising productivity arises out of this search for ephemeral relative surplus value. And it generates a social form, provided it affects the value of labour power. It seems to me important when reading these two chapters and the, ch the long chapter on machinery that follows, to recognise that Marx is as interested in organisational form, if you like, the the software, as he is in the machines, the hardware, and all the rest of it. So you have to look at, at Marx's theory of technology as not simply be about machinery, but also being about organizational form. And the two organizational forms, which are basic, right through to our situation, are cooperation and division of labor, and how those work. The distinctive form under capitalism is, of course, the, the development of machinery and a machine culture in, in general. But that doesn't mean that cooperation and division of labor disappear. They are integral to the acquisition of relative surplus value because both cooperation and division of labor, when you look at the reorganizations, are about in finding ways to increase productivity. What you'll find also in, in, in these chapters is, is, again, a question which was posed uh, very much in the chapter on the labour process, where Marx does not actually view the labour pro process as something negative. He views it as something potentially creative, potentially uh, beneficial, and satisfying and all the rest of it, and it's only under capitalism that this is turned into something rather negative. And I think you'll get a similar atmosphere in these chapters which suggest that cooperation is not a bad thing. In fact, it's a, it's a wonderful capacity we have. Again, division of labor is not a bad thing. The only interesting question for Marx is how are divisions of labour and cooperation mobilised under capitalism, and with what effects, which we see are broadly going to be negative with some positive uh, qualities as well. And the chapter of machinery is going to be much more uh, controversial, because the issue there will be to what degree the machines themselves are inherently so capitalistic that you can't <coughs> really hold with them very much longer if you want to be socialist, or to what degree are they also, is it possible also to convert them into something which is positive uh, for humanity in general and for the labourer in particular. Now the chapter on cooperation then <coughs> takes up this first way of thinking about things, and he points out immediately that one of the benefits that comes from cooperation is the capacity for increasing scale of production. And there is, of course, a long theory <coughs> in the history of political economy about increasing scale, and the way in which increasing scale can increase productivity. So the doctrine of increasing scale uh, is a very important one to Marx, and over the first few pages 
he spends time talking about this, in which he's prepared to acknowledge the potential positive aspects of it. So on 443, he defines cooperation by saying, where numerous workers work together side by side in accordance with a plan, whether in the same process or in different but connected process, this form of labour is called cooperation. Note the word plan there, it's going to become an important idea. The result, he says, towards the bottom of 4.43, not only do we have and here an increase in the productive power of the individual by means of cooperation, but the creation of a new productive power which is intrinsically a collective one. And this collective one, he says, begets in all most industries a rivalry and a stimulation of the animal spirits which heightens the efficiency of each individual worker. This is why a dozen people working together will produce far more in their collective working day of 144 hours and 12 isolated men each working for 12 hours. So he then talks about the way in which that cooperation can be mobilized within industry, and what this allows to occur. So on 446, in 447, he talks about the way in which cooperation allows work to be carried on over a large area. On the other hand, while extending the scale of production, it renders possible a relative contraction of its arena. The simultaneous restriction of space and extension of effectiveness, which allows a large number of incidental expenses to be spared, results from the massing together of workers and of various labour processes and the concentration of the means of production. Interesting tension here between the expansion, the geographical expansion, the spatial expansion, and the geographical concentration. And as he will point out later on, this geographical concentration, bringing workers together, has certain political consequences as well. But, he insists on 447 towards the bottom there, towards the middle there, the special productive power of the combined working day is, under all circumstances, the social productive power of labour, or the productive power of social labour. This power arises from cooperation itself. Again, when the worker cooperates in a planned way with others, he strips off the fetters of his individuality and develops the capability, capabilities of his species. Now, occasionally Marx goes back to some notion of species being, which is very important in the economic and philosophic manuscripts, and here's one of those moments. And at this point it's very hard to view this discussion of cooperation in a negative light. You strip off the fetters of your individuality and develop the capability of the species. There's a sort of almost positive tone about this. But as in the chapter on the labour process, he then says, more or less, well, let us now return to what our capitalist does with this. And the first point he makes on 448 is the capitalist, in order to launch cooperation, has to have a, a mass of capital available at the, at the start. So the big one of the big questions is, how much do they need to start this whole process? And where does it come from? There are, if you like, what, you, what we now call barriers to entry into any production process. How much do you need to start up? And this also introduces, in a shadowy way at the bottom of 448, a distinction which is going to come back again. He says, we also saw that at first the subjection of labour to capital was only a formal result of the fact that the worker, instead of working for himself, works for and consequently under the capitalist. And then he goes on to say, through the cooperation of numerous wage labourers, the command of capital develops into a requirement for carrying on the labour process itself into a real condition of production. Now he also, he talks, he's introducing here this distinction between a formal subjection to capital, 
or subsumption under capital against a real subjection to capital, subsumption under capital. And what he means by this is that if you had a putting out system, and you had individuals all over the place, and I'm a merchant capitalist, each one of those mer each one of those laborers out there in the cottages would be working for themselves, I wouldn't be overseeing them at all. I wouldn't even know what they're doing. But I'd go out there and I'd get their uh, goods, so that would be, if you like, the formal subsumption. That they depend upon me for their livelihood, but I am not in control of their production process. When I round up all of those people and bring them into a factory, they're under my supervision under my direct supervision. And that is the formal subsumption. So, sorry, that's the real subsumption. So the formal is out there, dependent, the real is inside the factory and totally under the supervision of the capitalist. So one of the first things that happens is that the labor moving into collective cooperation in a factory environment starts to be under the directing authority of the capitalist. So he starts to compare this with that of the orchestra conductor and says, there is the work of directing, superintending and adjusting becomes one of the functions of capital from the moment that the labor under capitalist control becomes cooperative. That is, the real subsumption results in this. As a specific function of capital, the directing function acquires its own special character. But the reverse of that, in the next paragraph, is as the number of cooperating workers increases, so too does their resistance to the domination of capital, and necessarily the pressure put on by capital to overcome this resistance. In other words, class struggle gets internalized on the shop floor. But now we start to see that the cooperation of wage labourers is brought about, in this instance, through the power of capital. And the result of that is that cooperation, instead of appearing as a power of labour, now appears as a power of capital. He says on the top of 450, the interconnection between their various labours confronts them in the realm of ideas as a plan drawn up by the capitalist, and in practice as his authority, as the powerful will of a being outside them who subjects their activity to his purpose. So here you move into the negative mode. The result of this, he says, a little bit further down the page, If capitalist direction is thus twofold in content, on the other hand a social labour process for the creation of a product, on the other hand capitalist process of valorization, in form it is purely despotic. And he then introduces the idea that there's going to be work of direct and constant supervision of the individual workers, and groups of workers to a special kind of wage labourer, an industrial army of workers under the command of a capitalist requires, like a real army, officers, managers and NCOs, foremen, overseers. So you end up with a certain structure of supervision of the cooperation, which is despotic. And as he goes on at the bottom of the page to say, it is not because he is a leader of industry that a man is a capitalist, on the contrary, he is a leader of industry because he is a capitalist. The leadership of industry is an attribute of capital. And then he becomes very explicit, middle of 451, because what happens to the labourers, he says, is they enter into relations with the capitalists, but not with each other. Their cooperation only begins with the labour process, but by then they have ceased to belong to themselves. On entering the labour process, they are incorporated into capital. As cooperators, as members of a working organism, they merely form a particular mode of existence of capital. This is what he means by a real subsumption of labour within capital. The socially productive power of labour develops as a free gift to capital, whenever the workers are placed under certain conditions. 
and it is capital which places them under these conditions. Because this power costs capital nothing, while on the other hand it is not developed by the worker until his labour belongs itself, itself belongs to capital, it appears as a power which capital possesses by its nature, a productive power inherent in capital. So we get this inversion from something that is an inherent power of labour, the social power of labour, to something that is appropriated entirely by capital and made to appear as a power of capital over the workers. This leads him to talk a little bit about some of the history of cooperation. And here he says that there has been, of course, enforced cooperation, Middle Ages, slavery, colonies, slave labour. But under capitalism again it develops as a form in which wage labour is manifest. And 453 says, a simultaneous employment of a large number of wage labourers in the same labour process, which is a necessary condition for this change, also forms the starting point of capitalist production. This starting point coincides with the birth of capital itself. If then, on the one hand, the capitalist mode of production is a historically necessary condition for the transformation of the labour process into a social process, so, on the other hand, this social form of the labour process is a method employed by capital for the more profitable exploitation of labour by increasing its productive power. There is an interesting thing here where Marx is talking about a co-evolution. Capital originates as it originates, it animates appropriates certain forms of cooperation. And certain forms of cooperation allow capital to start to raise productivity to produce surplus value. And we can never forget, however, that this originary point stays with the whole history of capitalism. So he concludes on 454, simple cooperation has always been and continues to be the predominant form in those branches of production in which capital operates on a large scale. But the division of labour and machinery play only an insignificant part. Cooperation remains the fundamental form of the capitalist mode of production, although in its simple shape it continues to appear as one particular form alongside the more developed ones. So you cannot imagine a capitalist mode of production without cooperation, but cooperation under the despotic control of the capitalist, with a whole kind of structure, supervisory authority, which introduces, by the way, the notion of a certain fragmentation or a layering within the working class itself that there's a managerial strata, foreman, operatives, so that instead of talking about the wage labourer, we now start to envision a working class which is stratified according to these kinds of functions within a cooperative apparatus which is fiercely despotic. Then we look at the division of labour and manufacture, the next chapter. And again, we look at the reorganisation of existing handicrafts, existing skills, existing tool technologies and the like, into something different. And he points out immediately, there are two ways you can do the reorganising. One is, you bring together in the same workshop under the control of a single capitalist, workers belonging to various independent handicrafts. So he talks about carriage making. On page 456 he makes a contrast with something like making nails or needles. You start off with 
raw materials and you have a continuous process. So in this case you're talking about a continuous process of one material which is being continually reorganized till it becomes out at the end as a needle. Whereas in the making of a carriage you have a complicated process of bringing together multiple handicrafts, same thing. So there are two ways in which you can do the reorganizing. But in both cases, he points out on 457, whatever may have been its particular starting point, its final form is always the same, a productive mechanism whose organs are human beings. That is, you bring human beings into a certain kind of relationship inside of the cooperative regime of the factory space. Furthermore, as you bring these divisions of labour together, you start to reorganize it in another kind of way. He says at the bottom of 457, the analysis of a process of production into its particular phases here coincides completely with the decomposition of a handicraft into its different partial operations. That is, when you start to see the production process as a whole, you start to see that you can split it up into smaller fragments and get specialized workers engaging at each point, either in terms of the sequence or in terms of the bringing together of the heterogeneity of many different, many different uh, handicrafts. But, he says, 458, handicraft remains the basis, a technically narrow basis which excludes a really scientific division of the production process into its component parts a barrier, right? Marx recognizes that capital doesn't like barrier because that's going to be a barrier that's going to have to be overcome, but here he's saying it's a barrier. Every partial process undergone by the product must be capable of being done by hand and of forming a separate handicraft. It's precisely because the skill of the craftsman thus continues to be the foundation of the production process that every worker becomes exclusively assigned to a partial function, and that his labour power becomes transformed into the lifelong organ of this partial function. So now, workers, instead of having the freedom to move, if you like, from one activity to another, are increasingly locked into a particular skill, a particular handicraft, a particular set of tools. And so he raises the question of the worker and his tools in section 2. He says, it is first clear that a worker who performs the same simple operation for the whole of his life converts his body into the automatic, one-sided implement of that operation. It's going to be an interesting discussion here as to whether the worker is in control of the tool well, the tool is in control of the worker, and what's the relationship between tool and worker? And here he's suggesting that the social imprisonment of somebody in a particular aspect or a particular specialization within the division of labor puts them in a position of essentially being con so connected to their tool that they cannot be liberated. And on 460, he talks further about this. A craftsman who performs the various partial operations must at one time change his place, at another time his tools. The transition from one operation to another interrupts the flow of his labour and creates gaps in his working day, so to speak. We've already seen that capital doesn't like gaps in the working day. These close up when he is tied to the same operation the whole day long. As against this, he says at the bottom of the pa that paragraph, constant labour in one uniform kind disturbs the intensity and flow of a man's vital forces which find recreation and delight in the change of activity itself. This is a partial concession to Fourier. Fourier's view of the labour process as against the imprisonment of one person with one tool in a division of labour for a lifetime. 
So we're beginning to see this kind of discussion of the positive and negative aspects of how the division of labour is working under capitalist control. The next section deals with the two fundamental forms of manufacture, heterogeneous and organic, and it really takes up the first, what he does in the first session, section, section, where he elaborates on the way in which heterogeneous processes are brought together, and then also how the continuous processes get reorganized. And this leads him to again introduce a new concept, which we have not encountered yet, on 464, where he starts to talk about the collective worker. The collective worker, he says, formed from the combination of the many specialized workers, draws the wire with one set of tooled up hands, straightens the wire with another set, armed with different tools, cuts it with another set, points it with another set, and so on. These different stages of the process, previously successive in time, have become simultaneous and contiguous in space. And here he goes, in the next couple of pages, to talk about the space-time organization of this process, and the efficiencies which can be won through efficient spatio-temporal reconstruction of how the labour process fits together by not losing any time, you gain in, in productivity. By rationalizing the way in which space is organized, you can save on movement costs. So the whole space-time structure becomes an organizational question, and he here introduces it as being fundamental to how capitalism works. Now there was a, a big innovation that the Japanese introduced into the labour processes in the 1970s, 80s. What was it? Collective effort. Hmm? Collective work. Well, it was collective, but something else. Just in time production. Just in time. That is scheduling of flows of goods in space and time such that you had almost no inventories anywhere in the system. I mean, a typical way in which a, a, a car factory would work was, you know, somebody would bring the, the wheels or something like that, and you'd have a whole stack of wheels outside, and they'd be sitting there, and you know, you'd have a big stack of them, and you'd have a big stack of brake parts and a big stack of wheel of, of, of you know upholstery and things like that. What the, just, what the Japanese did was to use a just-in-time system. It is they organized the flows so that there was almost you could see almost no inventory out there. None at all. The, the, the trucks would come up to the, the place and, and, and exactly the same number of wheels you needed on that day would be on the truck, exactly the number of, of other component parts would be on the truck. This was a tremendous innovation in industrial production, it rev and, it, and it actually was the innovation which of course gave the Japanese car industry it's big competitive advantage over all others during the 1980s. So suddenly you find all of the car companies everywhere around the world are engaging in the just-in-time system. General Motors goes for it, they all go for it. So the just-in-time system is, I think, again, a very good contemporary example of exactly what Marx is talking about. And it was, of course, put in that competitive stuff about relative surplus value. When the Japanese got this organizational form of the just-in-time system, they got this extra surplus value. They got the ephemeral form, so everybody else scrambles to catch up. This also allowed, by the way, increasing subcontracting to go on. You no longer had to have everything in the plant, you had plants out there that were independent of you, you're not responsible for their health care or their pensions or anything like that, but you've got a just-in-time system where you organize 
those plants outside, so on a given day they have exactly what you, you need there. Now, this of course is rather vulnerable to disruption. In the just-in-time system, uh, so for instance Ford Motors in, in, in Europe had a just-in-time system between its works, and one works went on strike, and all the factories around Europe had to close down because, and they had to close down very fast because none of them had any inventories of whatever it was this factory was producing. So it actually empowers workers to some degree by the fact that if they go on strike they can stop the whole thing, uh, because it is so tightly scheduled and so tightly organized. But I think what is interesting about these passages on 464 to 465 is that Marx is recognizing that a major organizational aspect of a capitalistic system is how space and time get set up and understood. This requires, however, an internal plan. And he introduces a theme which is going to come back later, for on 465, he talks about the rule that the labour time expended on a commodity should not exceed the amount socially necessary to produce it is one that appears in the production of commodities in general to be enforced from outside by the action of competition. In manufacture, on the contrary, the provision of a given quantity of the product in a given period of labour is a technical law of the process of production itself. The distinction between what the market enforces and what is done by internal planning and here he's talking about internal planning, and the way in which that internal planning, by reorchestrating how space and time gets used, can produce these efficiencies. But, again, there is a barrier and the barrier lies in the fact that you're still dealing with handicrafts. And he then says on 468, well, it's interesting about the technologies of different social orders. He says, the Roman Empire handed down the elementary form of all machinery in the shape of the water wheel. The handicraft period bequeathed to us the great inventions of the compass, gunpowder, type printing and the automatic clock. But on the whole, machinery played that subordinate part which Adam Smith assigns to it in comparison with the division of labour. That is, up until the end of the 18th century, capitalists were not really homing in on machinery and all the rest of it as a way to improve their productive efficiency. They were using these other methods. And of course there were innovations like compass and gunpowder and all the rest of it, but we hadn't got this internalization of technological innovation within the capitalist mode of production which happens later on with machinery and, and modern industry. But nevertheless there is an impact on the workers even at this early stage. And the impact is already foreseen a little bit earlier, 469, he repeats the argument, the habit of doing only one thing converts him into an organ which operates with the certainty of a force of nature, while his connection with the whole mechanism compels him to work with the regularity of a machine. And further down, manufacture therefore develops a hierarchy of labour powers, to which there corresponds a scale of wages. And this derives from the fact, as he said at the top, that workers are divided, classified and grouped according to their predominant qualities. And we get introduced, therefore, even at this stage, as he says on 470, into a distinction between skilled and unskilled labourers. He says on 470, alongside the gradations of the hierarchy there appears the simple separation of the workers into skilled and unskilled. For the latter the cost of apprenticeship diminish, uh, vanishes, for the former it diminishes compared with that required of the craftsman. In the, both cases the value of labour power falls, because there's de-skilling, he's beginning to talk about 
a de-skilling process which is going on. But an exception to this law occurs whenever the decomposition of the labour process gives rise to new and comprehensive functions which, which either did not appear at all in handicrafts or not to the same extent. The relative devaluation of labour power caused by the disappearance or reduction of the expenses of apprenticeship directly implies a higher degree of valorization of capital. For everything that shortens the necessary labour time required for the reproduction of labour power extends the domain of surplus labour. What we're dealing with here is the fact that in any re reorganization of a labour process, there can be de-skilling, but there's going to be a small group that's re-skilled, if you want to call it that, and put in a superior position. And so you cannot divorce, you cannot simply say it's all de-skilling, you've got to say it's de-skilling and reskilling going on at the same time, and the reskilling can sometimes empower certain segments of workers relative to other segments of workers. Then comes the key section, the division of labour in manufacture and the division of labour in society. What he's really concerned to do here is to make a big distinction between the detailed division of labour in the workshop, which occurs under the planned design of the capitalist, under the direct supervision of the capitalist, and the division of labour that occurs through market coordinations. And we have to see those two in relationship to each other. That is, they are not independent of each other. So we have to look at these two kinds of division of labour which get set up in this manufacturing period. As he says, the division of labour within, this is on 471, within society develops from one starting point. The corresponding restriction of individuals to particular vocations or callings develops from another starting point, which is diametrically opposed to the first. The second starting point is also that of the division of labour within manufacture. Within a family and after further development within a tribe there springs up naturally a division of labour caused by differences of sex and age and therefore based on a purely physiological foundation. Marx might get some criticism for that, but that's his view. On the other hand, he says, as I've already remarked, the exchange of products springs up at the points where different families, tribes or communities come into contact. For at the dawn of civilization, it is not private individuals but families, tribes, etc. that meet on an independent footing. Different communities find different means of production and different means of subsistence in their natural environment, hence their modes of production and living, as well as their products, are different. So this brings him then to talk about exchange relations between different communities with different assets, different resources, different kinds of products. And beyond that, we get his argument, which is very briefly set up here but which is important in general, that the foundation of every division of labour which has attained a certain degree of development has been brought about by the exchange of commodities is the separation of town from country. That is, the relation between town and country, and that dialectic is important historically. He's not going to go into it very much more here, but elsewhere he does in some considerable detail. And that, of course, leads him to think about the number and density of the population, which corresponds to the collection of workers together in one workshop. And this, he says, is a precondition of the division of labour within society. Nevertheless, this density is more or less relative. A relatively thinly populate, populated country, with a well-developed means of communication, has a denser population than a more numerously populated country with badly developed means of communication. In this sense, the northern states of the USA, for instance, are more thickly populated than India. Interesting, Marx is using notions of relative space-time here. 
in actually quite an innovative way. Uh, so he's not seeing the terrain upon which this is happening as fixed. It is in fact varying depending upon density of population and transport and communication technologies and availabilities. So the division of labour in, ma in manufacture, however, assumes that society has already attained a certain degree of development. Inversely, the division of labour in manufacture reacts back upon that society, developing and multiplying it further. Now, what we're getting here is the beginnings of the argument that there is what's called increasing roundaboutness in production, increasing complexity of production. That is, you go from a simple kind of situation where somebody makes something, to a situation where you start to make pieces of something which then get traded in the market for other pieces of something which then get collectively put together to make the something that is eventually going to be consumed. And this increasing roundaboutness of production is also associated, as he says on 475, with increasing emphasis upon territorial divisions of labour, territorial specialisations of labour. 474 in the middle there, he says, the territorial division of labour which confines special branches of production to special districts of a country acquires fresh stimulus from the system of manufacture which exploits all natural peculiarities. And he then introduces the notion of the colonial system and the extension of the world market, both of which form part of the general conditions for the existence of the manufacturing period, notice this, furnish us with rich materials for displaying the division of labour in society. But he's going to insist, towards the bottom, that while there are analogies and links between division of labour in society and within the workshop, they differ not only in degree but also in kind. And he then gets into some serious discussion of Adam Smith, which brings him to what I think is the, the crucial passages right at the bottom of 475 and to 476. The division of labour within society is mediated through the purchase and sale of the products of different branches of industry while the connection between the various partial operations in a workshop is mediated through the sale of the labour power of several workers to one capitalist who applies it as combined labour power. The division of labour within manufacture presupposes a concentration of the means of production in the hands of one capitalist. The division of labour within society presupposes a dispersal of those means among many independent producers of commodities. While within the workshop the iron law of proportionality subjects definite numbers of workers to definite functions, in the society outside the workshop the play of chance and caprice results in a motley pattern of distribution of the producers and their means of production among the various branches of social labour. Okay, okay, he says, the different spheres of production constantly tend towards equilibrium because that's the way the market works and he then explains why, going back over the laws of exchange of commodities. But he then goes on to point out, this constant tendency on the part of the various spheres of production towards equilibrium comes into play only as a reaction against the constant upsetting of this equilibrium. That is, when demand and supply gets out of kilter, all kinds of messes happen and you know, prices yo-yo all over the place, and there's an adjustment. Producers have to adjust what they're producing and how much. And he says, the planned and regulated a priori system on which the division of labour is implemented within the workshop becomes in the division of labour within society an a posteriori necess necessity imposed by nature controlling the unregulated caprice of the producers and perceptible in the fluctuations of the barometer of market prices. Division of labour within the workshop implies the undisputed authority of the capitalist over men. 
who are merely members of a total mechanism which belongs to him. The division of labour within society brings into contact independent producers of commodities, who acknowledge no authority other than that of competition, of the coercion exerted by the pressure of their reciprocal interests, just as in the animal kingdom the war of all against all more or less preserves the condition of existence of every species. So he then goes on to say, the same bourgeois consciousness which celebrates the division of labour in the workshop, the lifelong annexation of the worker to a partial operation and his complete subjection to capital as an organisation of labour that increases its productive power, denounces with equal vigour every conscious attempt to control and regulate the process of production socially, as an inroad upon such sacred things as the rights of property, freedom and the self-determining genius of the individual capitalist. It is very characteristic that the enthusiastic apologists of the factory system have nothing more damning to urge against a general organisation of labour in society than that it would turn the whole of society into a factory. The contrast, he then goes on to say, is anarchy in the social division of labour and despotism in the manufacturing division of labour mutually condition each other. Now, what he's saying here is that capitalists actually love the planned organisation of production within their factory. And they abhor, however, the idea of any kind of social planning of production outside of the factory. So when you hear people going on and on and on about how planning is a bad thing, why don't you say, well, why do they do it so much inside of General Motors? Why are they doing it so much in all of these corporations? Why is it they're engaging in things like total quality management, input-output analysis, all the rest of it? Why are, they, why are they absolutely into sort of optimal scheduling and design, all this sort of thing? They're, they're, they're planning everything down to the finest detail. So next time somebody says planning is a bad thing, just say, well, okay, abandon it in General Motors and see what happens to any company that, 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 that fails to plan. And if they can plan very well, then why can't we? Well, the answer then is, well, then you would turn the whole world into one big factory, and look how appalling the factory is. <laughs> and you kind of say, yes, okay, well that's precisely the point, right? The factory is indeed appalling, but that's because you're planning it in, a way, in that particular kind of way that you're making the factory appalling. And you're admitting it's so appalling by saying, oh my God, if you made the whole world like a factory, just think, I mean, you might even make us work in that kind of fashion. Instead of liberating our genius, or our individual genius, to go about and do all these kinds of innovative things we like to do, through reorgani constant reorganizations of the production process. So what Marx is doing here is kind of mocking a little bit this whole attempt to say that you cannot plan. And there are people who have been sort of saying, well, you know, centralized planning is, is impossible. I mean, look at what the Soviet Union got into and all the rest of it. Obviously it doesn't work. And it doesn't work because it's so complex. The complexity is just too much. And you say, well, actually, if you look at the complexity involved in a large corporation, you know, producing uh, electronic goods or something like that, actually you find it pretty complex. So you can't make the argument of complexity that's, that's against this. So what Marx is doing here is kind of contrasting these two notions of the division of labour, the detailed division of labour which is mathematically worked out, scheduled, optimally scheduled, optimally configured, planned down to the last detail with labourers kind of put in slots in certain kinds of ways to maximise efficiency against the incredible inefficiencies of the market system, which nevertheless, through the coercive laws of competition, reinforce the des despotism that occurs inside of the capitalist system, inside the, inside the workplace. 
because you can see immediately that if I have a super system of exploitation which gives me surplus value, then others are going to have to follow me. I mentioned the just-in-time system. If I come up with a super-efficient way of organizing labor, which is very repressive for labor, but is super-efficient for me, then all my competitors are going to have to follow me. So the repressions inside of the factory are not independent of the competitive pressures that are organized outside. Now, the capitalist reorganization of the manufacturing system Section 5, just briefly Again we get on 481 the strong idea that what's going on here is the appropriation of the productive powers of labor by capital. And in both of these sections, Marx is trying to say to the working class and the laborers, these are your productive powers. Capital is appropriating them. And as it appropriates them, it makes it seem as if they're, they're productive powers of capital. He says on 481, the productive power which results from the combination of various kinds of labor appears as the productive power of capital. Manufacture proper not only subjects the previously independent worker to the discipline and command of capital, but creates an addition, a hierarchical structure amongst the workers themselves. Converts the worker into a crippled monstrosity by furthering his particular skill as in a forcing house through the suppression of a whole world of productive drives and inclinations. Just as in the states of La Plata they butcher a whole beast for the sake of his hide or his tallow, not only is the specialized work distributed among the different individuals, but the individual himself is divided up and transformed into the automatic motor of a detailed operation, thus realizing the absurd fable of Menenius Agrippa, which presents man as a mere fragment of his own body. Again, the body politics of this is that workers are reduced to being fragments of themselves. And part of that fragmentation is also leading to, as he says on 482, unfitted by nature, and you're being a bit ironic here, to make anything independently, the manufacturing worker develops his productive acti activity only as an appendage of that workshop. That is, the worker is now an appendage of the workshop rather than in command of it. Further, the possibility of an intelligent direction of production expands in one direction because it vanishes in many others. What is lost by the specialized workers is concentrated in the capital which confronts them. It is a result of the division of labor in manufacture that the worker is brought face to face with the intellectual potentialities of the material process of production as the property of another, and as a power which rules over him. That is, intellectual labor also becomes in the domain of capital. Mental activities. This process of separation starts in simple cooperation. It is developed in manufacture which mutilates the worker, turning him into a fragment of himself. It is completed in large-scale industry which makes science a potentiality for production which is distinct from labor and presses it into the service of capital. The result of this is an impoverishment of the worker, as he says on the next page, an individual productive power. And he then quotes Adam Smith, very interesting quote. The understandings of the greater part of men, says Adam Smith, are necessarily formed by their ordinary employments. The man whose whole life is spent in performing a few simple operations has no occasion to exert his understanding. He generally becomes as stupid and ignorant as it is possible for a human creature to become. After describing the stupidity of the specialized worker, he goes on, 
The uniformity of his stationary life naturally corrupts the courage of his mind. It corrupts even the activity of his body and renders him, him incapable of exerting his strength with vigour and perseverance in any other employments than that to which he has been bred. His de dexterity in his own particular trade seems in this manner to be acquired at the expense of his intellectual, social and martial virtues. But in every improved and civilised society this is the state into which the labouring poor, that is, the great body of the people must necessarily fall. Now Marx is partially in is, in is, is inclined to accept, to some degree, Adam Smith's argument that the repressions of the workplace do indeed produce this kind of situation. And it's one of the things I like to ask is that my academic colleagues, to what degree is your ordinary employment corrupting the courage of your mind? It's not hard to have the courage of your mind corrupted by your ordinary employment at all. And it's not just workers who suffer from this problem, journalists, media folk, university professors, we all have it. You're lucky, you're students, you don't have it yet, <laughs> I hope. So, as he, Marx goes on to say on the next page, some crippling of mind and body is inseparable even from the division of labour and society as a whole. And this does indeed produce what he calls industrial pathology. Now, Marx is not going to pathologize the whole of the working class at all, but he's going to say, look, there are impacts of all of this on people's abilities to react, to think. And for those of you who've ever done much organizing with, with you know, people who are working 80 hours a week, you find it's not an implausible thing at all to point out that indeed they don't have time to think about most of the things that we would expect them to think about given their working class position. They're so busy trying to make ends meet, they're so busy trying to get enough food on the table for their kids in time and do all those kinds of things, they don't have time. And they don't even have the kind of if you like, the, the, the time and the, and, 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 the, and, and, and the ability to sit around and think and think through a lot of these issues. So Marx is, is sort of quoting Adam Smith as being, yeah, extreme about this, but nevertheless there is something to it which we have to recognize. So the division of labour then is something that comes about through this transformation in the manufacturing period. And Marx is here setting up a manufacturing system and a manufacturing period. This has limits. And the limit, he says, is of course going to be the technology. So right at the end of the chapter he says, 490, 491, manufacture was unable either to seize upon the production of society to its full extent or to revolutionize that production at its very core. It towered up, and, he's, and Marx is admiring of it really, as an artificial economic construction on the broad foundation of the town handicrafts and the domestic industries of the countryside. At a certain stage of its development the narrow technical basis on which manufacture rested came into contradiction with the requirements of production which it had itself created. Which is of course then going to lead right at the end to him saying, it is machines that abolish the role of the handicraftsman as a regulating principle of social production. And it is the next chapter then that we're going to deal with machines. Since we're out of time, I want to go through as much of the machinery and large-scale industry chapter as possible next time, and I would suggest you try to read at least up to page 588. No, sorry, do it to 564. 564.
But I also want you to do something else. I want you to read very, very carefully the footnote on page 493 that goes over into 494. I'm going to spend a good deal of time on that footnote 493 to 4. It's one of the few places where Marx actually says something very concrete about his method, and I think it's very important you understand what he's talking about. So it's footnote 4, about Darwin and technology and, tech and all the rest of it, that we need to look at. So we'll take that up next time, okay? So let's leave it there.